Duarte is Sara Shahanagi from Toulouse. Uh, she'll be presenting competition and herding in breaking news. Uh, we also are very happy to have guest panelists, uh, Chiara Margaria and Yuzo Valimaki. Um, the rules are the usual ones, uh, one hour presentation, 15 minutes for discussion. Uh, Sara is uh, has no co-author, so uh, if you have any questions, just feel free to unmute yourselves. If you're shy, write them in the, in the chat and we'll read them out loud. Um, and just a reminder that next week there is no VSET because it's Thanksgiving and we don't think we'd have a massive audience. Families tend not to like uh, people uh, logging on on Zoom while the turkey is being served, I guess. So um, without further ado, uh, Sarah. Great. Uh, so before I start, a big thank you to all the organizers for having me and also thank you to Yuso and Chiara for being panelists. Um, so, sorry, uh, to motivate this uh, project, I'm going to start with two facts about the market for news. The first is that despite news firms touting the importance of accuracy, uh, media errors are actually quite commonplace and they've surrounded some of the biggest breaking news events in modern history. This has included events such as terrorist attacks, uh, where key details regarding the events uh, that transpired were completely misidentified. And I want to emphasize that these are not small details, but really big ones, like what happened, who the perpetrators were, and in case of in the case of the London bombings, uh, whether it was actually a terrorist attack. Uh, but such errors have also pertained to other sorts of events, including political scandals. Uh, one example of this occurred in 2017, uh, during the special counsel investigation of Donald Trump, when ABC News reported that Michael Flynn was going to testify against Trump, and this bombshell report turned out to be completely false. So that's just to name a few examples. Uh, the second fact about the market for news is that accuracy matters, and in particular, it matters to consumers. Uh, this is demonstrated in part by survey data where consumers state accuracy to be the most important function of news to them, uh, ranking it above other qualities such as unbiasedness and thorough coverage. But beyond this, uh, errors can be damaging to news firms' reputation. And this is demonstrated in part by the fact that these firms will go to great lengths to mitigate such reputational harms, including uh, firing journalists. So actually in 2017, when uh, ABC News made this reporting error, uh, they actually ended up firing Brian Ross, who was their lead investigative journalist at the time and who had been with the firm for many years, but who was responsible for this error. So this demonstrates that these firms recognize these reputational harms and uh, are willing to go to lengths to mitigate them. So given these two facts, uh, my objective with this paper is twofold. First, I ask, why do firms commit errors? And in particular, if these errors are costly, what incentives do firms have to make errors? I'm thinking specifically about strategic motives that firms have to make errors that are otherwise completely avoidable. So that's my first question. The second thing I want to look at um, is when are news firms going to be the most susceptible to making mistakes? In particular, I'm going to ask when over the course of the news cycle is the firm going to be at risk for making errors? So this is really a question of dynamics. Uh, so to answer these two questions, I'm going to present a dynamic model of breaking news which is meant to capture some of the more salient features of the breaking news environment. The first uh, characteristic that I include is that firms are going to seek market share. That's what their objective is going to be. Second, I assume that consumers have a preference for accuracy. And what this is going to mean for the firm is that error prone reporting is going to be costly for them. And it's going to be costly in two different ways. First, an error is going to be costly ex post after it has been exposed, capturing the sort of reputational harm that a firm will uh, suffer. 
But beyond this, uh, error prone reporting will be costly even before these errors can be exposed. And this is because the market share that the firm enjoys depends on their credibility in the eyes of consumers. And finally, I'm going to account for uh, an important feature of uh, breaking news, which is, of course, competition. Uh, so just to give you a brief preview of the results that I obtained regarding the first question of why do firms make mistakes, um, I find that errors are going to be strategic responses to certain characteristics of the environment. The first is the inability of firms to commit to truth telling. In particular, what this is going to mean is that uh, firms are going to have a temptation to fake, where I define faking as being reporting a story despite not having confirmed it after their credibility has already been established, because by doing so, they can get some market share. And what I show is that this inability to commit will potentially result in errors happening even in the absence of competition, that because of this, even a monopolist can commit errors in equilibrium. Um, but I find that competition is going to exacerbate errors, and it's going to do so through two different channels. The first channel is a preemptive motive, where firms are going to potentially enjoy a greater market share from reporting before their rivals. This gives them an incentive to report hastily and therefore commit errors. Now, Competition is going to cause errors through the second channel, which is observational learning. And observational learning is going to work differently because it's going to cause existing errors to propagate through the market. Where one firm makes a mistake, other firms are going to observe that report, not knowing that it's necessarily an error. They're, they become more confident that the story is true, and therefore uh, they're going to be more prone to uh, repeating that mistake. So. Um, that's the first question. Now, the second question I asked was about dynamics. Um, when is the firm going to be susceptible to making mistakes? And the first thing I find is that um, firms are going to become dynamically more credible and fake less over the course of time, conditional on their rivals remaining silent. Um, and in particular, this is going to happen whenever a firm uh, has some preemptive motive. Uh, I show that this uh, increasing credibility that I mentioned is going to play an important role in equilibrium. Uh, because firms have an incentive to preempt their rivals potentially, this increasing credibility is going to mitigate this incentive and give firms an incentive to uh, wait and delay their reporting. But beyond this, dynamics are going to take a separate form which is discrete changes in reporting behavior in response to a rival report. Something that I document is, um, I call it the copycat effect, where one report by one firm causes a discrete jump in the probability of faking. So a discrete increase in the rate at which firms uh, said make fake reports. Uh, now, the economic significance of this is that it's going to imply that firms are going to herd, not just on their decision to report a story, but also in the timing of their reports. Uh, and in turn, what this means is that this is going to mean clustering in the timing of both correct reports and errors. Now, this is something for which there is both anecdotal evidence and some uh, empirical work documenting this sort of uh, clustering and timing. So the copycat effect uh, provides some strategic explanation for this. Um, if there are any questions on this, I can move on to the model. Sarah, I do have a question actually. Um, sure. You were you were talking about the previous slide, um, this emergence of mitigation. Uh, no, the one after this. Um, oh, yes. yes, and there's a mitigate. So I was trying to guess, are you going to, give us a story where depending on some parameters the mitigation is um is there that sounds that's not what you're doing because you call it endogenous so what i'm thinking here is are there multiple equilibria where there's an equilibrium where people 
you know, wait until the news is pretty firm and then they they reveal. And so given that you expect everybody to be absolutely sure, you take your time as well because there's no rush. And then there's equilibrium where everybody just releases information as soon as they have it without really checking it. And so you have to do the same. Otherwise, you're always going to be behind. Is uh, Which of these two are, are we thinking about? Um, so in general, I'll say that the equilibrium is going to be unique. Mm -hmm. So um, you're always going to be in sort of one situation where either there is a preemptive motive. And so all of us are faking and we have this incentive to report before each other. So either that's going to happen or you can also be in a situation which I think might be what you were describing where there's going to be no preemptive motive where we we might still be making up reports but we're not doing it because we're afraid somebody else is going to do it before us. Um, and this mitigation that I was referring to only happens in the first case. So it only happens in the case where you do have a preemptive motive. Otherwise, none of that appears. Um, I'm not sure if I addressed your question but um, I, I probably asked the question too soon. Oh, no. Uh, but ho hopefully it'll be clear. Okay. So um, moving on to the model, uh, I assume here that there exists just one story. Uh, now, in the case of uh, going back to the examples that, is, that I discussed, we can think of this story as Michael Flynn is going to testify against Donald Trump in the special counsel investigation. Now, there's going to be a binary state, either zero or one, which is going to indicate whether the story is true. And time is going to be continuous here with an infinite horizon. Uh, there's going to be N different uh, firms and one representative consumer. And all players are going to be endowed at time zero with some interior common prior that the story is true. So these are just the, the fundamentals. Now, um, these N different firms are going to be privately learning and reporting about the story. Uh, so what that's going to look like is first, firms are going to learn privately and they're going to do so via a one-sided plus on signal. What that means specifically is that if the story is true, if theta equals one, then confirmation of this fact is going to be uh, privately uh, shown to a particular firm at a Poisson rate lambda. Otherwise, no signal arrives. So I assume that these uh, signals are, or these arrivals are independent across the different firms. And the way we can interpret this learning process is as one where firms are seeking evidence to confirm a story, where they're reaching out to reliable sources such as police departments or reliable contacts who have the ability to definitively confirm that the story is true. Um, and that's how they're going to be learning is through this sort of process. Now, regarding reporting, each firm is going to have um, one opportunity to report at any time that they wish, though they can choose to never report. So that option is always there, but they have at most one opportunity to do so. And how we can interpret uh, a report is as a claim that theta equals one, that the story is true. For now, this interpretation, uh, there's really no explanation for it at this point moment, but when I show you the payoff function, it should become clear. Um, I'm going to call a report an error if it's made despite the story being false. So if theta equals zero and a report is made, we call that an error. And because this reporting is observed not just by the consumer, but also by the uh, other firms, this is where observational learning is going to come into play because these firms are going to be learning not just through that private signal that they get, but also by observing the reporting behavior of the other firms, of their competitors. So moving on to the payoff function of the firm, um, I assume that if the firm chooses to never report, they always just earn their outside option of zero. 
But if they do report, their payoff is going to consist of two separate components. The first is going to be the immediate market share that the firm enjoys from reporting. So we can think of this as uh, clicks or views um, that the firm gets. But the second component is that if the firm reports and they made an error, they incur some uh, cost from doing so. So to get a bit more specific, this market share is the product of two terms, KN and alpha. What N denotes is the firm's order in reporting. Was it the first, the second, or the third, et cetera? And um, I assume that these Ks are constants and they're decreasing in the order with which the firm reports. So all else equal, the firm earns a higher market share from being the first than from being the second, et cetera, et cetera. Um, now, the second component of this market share is alpha. And alpha is the credibility of the report that the firm made. Um, I specifically define credibility to be the consumer's belief that the story that they're, the report that they're seeing um, was confirmed, that the a firm was able to get that private confirmation before reporting the story. Um, and finally, of course, this uh, cost of error, um, I assume that if the firm makes an error, they incur some cost data. Um, now, before I move on, I just want to emphasize that um, while the KN and beta here are exogenous parameters, this alpha is endogenous, it's a belief. Um, so the endogeneity of alpha is going to play an important role in equilibrium. Sorry, and it's also evolving over time. Exactly, yes. Um, I'll show you in a moment that I'll be looking specifically at uh, Markov equilibrium and yeah, but it is uh, evolving over time. Do we ask questions about the payoffs now or after the talk? I'm happy to take questions now. If, yeah. So, so if you if you do not report, you you get a fixed payoff, even though everybody else uh, uh, reported a false story and you're the only one who didn't. Right. Okay. So so that 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 could be another source of credibility, right, in the market. You're referring specifically to being a person who chose not to report when everyone else who did. sort of seem, seems to have bet on this event that that theta is equal to zero and not jump on the bandwagon with the others. Absolutely. So in general, yes, I, I think that this is something that that would happen or would be relevant being affirmed to not report a false story. The model that I have here. It, it doesn't account for that. It just says the outside okay. option yeah, is completely not a function. So you're absolutely correct. Yeah. Um, Can I also ask a question about payoff? So here, everything needs, so the, the game here is about timing, you know, trying to preempt the others, but otherwise it's a zero one, it's a very binary choice. So another way to, to look at that would be is to fix the timing, you know, timing is one one decision, but there's a second layer of decision is you report something and, and there's a degrees of grayness and you say there is an allegation or there's something. And then there's a competition on that margin between firms when they try to maybe preempt each other. But in a moment, just trying to be more extreme and build that among their customers. I see. So... You're saying a situation where you're you're not strategically choosing your timing, but maybe the certainty with which you you say, I yeah. think this is true and I'm I'm very sure about it. Or, or on both dimensions. Yeah. So I can tell you, of course, I think it would be it would be really nice to incorporate that into the setting. Um I've avoided it for the purposes of tractability because it would um with this endogenous alpha and having some sort of um yeah, having multiple claims by the firms, it, it would really complicate things, but for sure, I, I think um, that would be something that I think would be very interesting to look at. Maybe one more. You, you, you have this sort of asymmetry between between the, the two realizations of theta. One of them is, is like you do an ex post verification for the, uh, what, what, 
what the state was and that sort of like easily seen how 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 i can imagine that happening the other one is an inference that's based on on knowledge of equilibrium strategies right the alpha right so yeah so so i'm i'm just wondering why 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 not uh, symmetry there that you get the boost for correct reporting rather than uh, credibility. Um. So I'm I'm not sure if I completely understand. Um. So this. When so you so let me ask it again then. Uh, my, my understanding of alpha was was the probability with which you believe that what I said was based on evidence. Yes. So exactly. it could have been just a, what what I said was that correct also like it. Uh, I see, right. Um, so I think that that is. I've actually worked with thinking you know, like instead of having credibility, have the market share depend on what is the uh, the uh, sorry the consumer's belief that uh, the the story is actually true that that's what your market share is now. The complication that that uh, introduces is not quite a complication, but the sort of unintuitive result, in my opinion, that this will obtain is that if the prior of the consumers is sufficiently high that the story is true, then this creates an incentive for firms to just report the story immediately. That um, consumers are, they don't even care if there was any verification, even though they share that same belief, seeing the firm parrot that gets them, it gets the firm market share. And to me, you know, from the perspective of a consumer, they watch the news because they're looking for some information beyond what they have. If they just have their prior confirmed, um, yeah. So th that's my, uh, the reason why I've taken this route. Uh, yeah. Sorry, I'll, I'll try one more. So, <laughs> so my understanding is that the reason why you put this red term is also to capture the fact that you really want to have a payoff specification so that once I take the action, I actually know already why, what my payoff is. It does not depend on whatever is going to happen in the game in the future. That's somewhat a shortcut we take. But effectively, I want to have an idea of future reputation consequences of of actually reporting a story that is false. And so my understanding is that you are taking this shortcut. But the, there are two things that I can think about. Like, yeah, so I just want to understand how hard it would that be to actually solve the model having payoff depend on the continuation game once I take the decision. And like, is there an alternative? So is that correct first this, uh, that I explained? Yes, or is there an alternative the way to somewhat, yeah, uh, take that into account? Yeah. Yeah, it is, it is a shortcut. I'm looking at a very reduced form way of looking at something like reputational harm, which you would expect to be completely endogenous here. Um, now, regarding your question of would it be that much more complicated, my answer is I think so, yes. Um, the reason being that if you were to have that uh, penalty depend on um, what happens for in the game in the future, then you're, we have both this endogenous alpha and um, this cost of error not being a fixed parameter, um, that's going to complicate things. Now, what I can tell you, something that I have worked with, is um, having this cost of error depend on the number of other firms that made a mistake. So if you make an error and you're the only one to do so versus being somebody who made an error and being in the company of other firms. So you might think that the penalty of error will depend on whether you were alone or whether other people did the same thing. And in that case, I can tell you qualitatively the equilibrium should be similar but this hurting that I referred to is going to be stronger in that case, because you're going to have um, firms knowing that once a competitor has reported, if they also choose to report, the total penalty that they might incur is going to be smaller because they would be sharing that. So that's sort of, it's not quite answering your question, but that's something where one, at least one situation where you can think of beta as, you know, this penalty as depending on what these other firms are doing. Um, yeah, or alternatively, you could say there are actually, con so now we are saying one consumer, but if we think about the continuum of consumer, I say there is a, a proportion of them are actu actually do know 
And so they are going to just somewhat punish me somewhat and, you know, cancel the subscription. So that's why actually the term is there. If I actually report something false, I'm going to lose that market share. So that would be a, you know, a somewhat way of motivating it, I guess. Right, but, exactly. Yeah. And I'll, I'll just briefly note that I do have a micro foundation for this market share as well, that uh, it works with exactly this notion that you referred to, where there's a continuum of consumers they have different costs from consuming. And the same way you can think of this cost of error as like maybe a continuum of consumers. Some of them are more forgiving than others. And uh, yeah, exactly. Thank you. Uh, so moving on to the reporting strategy of firms, I'm looking specifically at Markov perfect equilibrium. So I'm going to define uh, Markov strategies. And what a Markov strategy is going to be here is it's going to be a pair of functions Q and B. Um, and these are functions of the Markov state here, which is P and N. P here is the belief um, that theta equals one, that the story is true. And N is the order of the next firm to report. Now, I assume uh, in taking the stance on strategies uh, that firms can report through two different means. First, they can make reports via point masses. And that's what this Q function indicates. It indicates the instantaneous probability with which the firm is reporting. Second, they have this other tool, which is the hazard rate. So they can also choose to send reports uh, continuously via some uh, non-homogeneous Poisson process and that is what this B function captures. So you have, for the firm has both the ability to send reports via point masses and continuously. Um, now I'm going to make a selection assumption, which is that firms are not going to withhold confirmed news. That once they have the belief one, they're going to report immediately. Uh, the reason why I make this assumption is I want to rule out gaps in reporting where for no firms report because credibility during that gap is zero. There's bad off path beliefs and you can support these sort of gaps. And with the selection assumption, I can eliminate that from happening. Now, what this assumption gets us is first that uh, given any belief, starting belief P, everyone who has not yet reported, all the firms who have not yet reported, um, are going to hold the same common belief after T time passes and nobody reports in between. So um, you have this property, the shared common belief. And um, because of the selection assumption, what the strategy, all the strategies effectively doing is just specifying both when and the extent to which firms are faking. Where I define faking to be reporting the story despite um, not knowing that it's true. So despite holding a belief less than one. So um, I said I'm going to be looking for Markov perfect equilibrium. Very briefly, all that is, is a strategy paired with beliefs, both alpha and P, over all histories, such that we have sequential rationality and consistency with Bayes' rule. Now, what Bayes' rule is going to imply specifically about alpha um, is that it's going to take the following form. If the firm is faking with a positive point mass at a particular time, then a report made at that time is going to yield zero credibility. The reason for that is that valid reports, so uh, reports that are made because the firm was able to confirm the story, those are arriving via a Poisson process. So the instantaneous probability of such a report is zero. If you have a positive point mass of fake reports at that time, then consumers know that if they see a report at that particular time, it has to be fake, and so they assign to it zero credibility. But if instead a report is made via um, sorry, a, a, point, a report is made at a time where there is no point mass in faking, credibility is going to be formed by the consumer by comparing the expected arrival rate of valid reports, this lambda p, to the arrival rate of fake reports, this b. 
So um, this function illustrates an important uh, equilibrium relationship here, which is that the more the firm fakes an equilibrium, the lower its credibility is, is going to be. Um, if there aren't any questions on uh, the model, I'm going to move on to uh, the characterization. So I'm going to start by establishing an important property, which is the necessity of a mixed strategy in equilibrium. Um, I'll get to that in a minute. Then I'm going to start with the monopoly benchmark as sort of um, a way of understanding how things look like in the absence of competition specifically looking at the possibility of errors and the role of commitment. And finally, um, I move on to the full characterization, full model characterization where competition is present. So regarding this uh, property that I mentioned, the necessity of a mixed strategy, um, I formalize this as lemma one. And all this says is that whenever the firm holds a belief less than one, that then the probability of um, the sorry the point mass of faking has to be zero. In other words, you can never have point masses in faking. Um, the reason for this is fairly straightforward, given what I just showed you about the credibility function. If there were a point mass in faking at a particular time, such a report would yield the firm zero credibility and thus zero market share. And because the firm is faking, there's a positive probability they're going to make an error and incur that penalty beta. So the clear profitable deviation here is to just not fake at that time. Because that way they can get uh, the, the outside option of zero versus a negative payoff. So what this tells us is that if the firm does fake, it needs to be faking by sending or generating fake reports via some non-homogeneous Poisson process. And what this means for the firm's incentives is that they need to be um, mixing. Sorry, about the, what it tells us about their strategy is that they need to be mixing. They need to be randomizing across um, faking along all times when its credibility is less than one. Um, now moving on to the monopoly characterization. Um, I find that the equilibrium under monopoly takes the following form. The credibility for the monopolist, just to be clear when I say monopolist, I'm looking at a setting where there's just one firm. The credibility for the monopolist is always going to be constant and it's going to be given by this value alpha M. This is going to be equal to beta over K, so the penalty of error, divided by the maximal market share that the firm can get. And I've dropped the index here because we only have one firm. As long as that ratio is less than one, and once it's greater than one, um, credibility is just going to be at its upper bound. So what this tells us about the monopoly equilibrium is the following. Regarding credibility, we have constant credibility, but also it's weakly increasing in beta the cost of error. So the more costly errors are, the more credible the firm is going to be in equilibrium. Regarding errors, it tells us that even under a monopoly, there's a possibility that errors will happen. Whenever that alpha is less than one, there's a po possibility that an error will occur. And in particular, such errors will happen when the consequences of making a mistake are relatively small. So whenever that beta is less than the maximal market share, that's when you can expect errors to happen. Um, just very briefly, uh, to give you an idea of why under a monopoly, credibility has to be constant, um, I'm going to show you what would happen if it were not the case. So on the left-hand side, we have the possibility that alpha is strictly increasing along some interval. Um, and on the right, where it's strictly decreasing. Now, what would go wrong on the left is that we have this interval where the firm needs to be indifferent um, across faking across all these times within the interval by that lemma that we just established. Um, but we see that the firm has a clear profitable deviation. They would never want to fake at this T lower bar 
because by waiting, they can uh, enjoy a higher alpha and thus a higher market share by faking at T upper bar. So that can't be an equilibrium. And on the right-hand side, we have a very similar thing happening. The firm would never want to fake at T upper bar. They would rather fake earlier and enjoy a higher market share. So again, we have a failure of that indifference condition and thus uh, equilibrium would fail in this case. Now, um, while we have that alpha is constant under monopoly, um, we do have dynamics in faking. In particular, this constant credibility means that faking is going to strictly decrease over the course of time uh, whenever the firm is not truthful. This is due to the fact that as time passes, the common belief PT is going down. So to maintain constant credibility, the rate at which the firm fakes needs to also go down because the lower that belief is, the lower the expected arrival rate of valid reports. And what this tells us is that the firm is becoming dynamically more truthful as time passes, even under a monopoly. Um, now, briefly, I want to talk a little bit about these uh, monopolist errors. So, Sorry, I just have one question. Sure. Uh, maybe I'm missing something obvious, but uh, how do you rule out an equilibrium in which uh, just at time zero, they just reveal with probability one, because uh, so, then you would have incentive to wait a split second? Uh, so the reason why you can't have that is because if you had um, everybody like reporting at period one, say, Sorry, and, I meant zero. I meant zero. Because you know, at zero, zero, what I'm thinking at zero, nobody knows anything. So we are all the same. So nobody can have received a piece of news anyway, or maybe that's not such a thing. So yeah, so the reason why we can't have that is because if you did have that happen in equilibrium, um, all those firms would be getting zero credibility from their reports. But also because their starting belief is less than one, they know that there's a positive uh Probably oh, right, because it's the credibility is not the, okay, that's exactly what you said, because what we said is the credibility is not the probability of the piece of news. Okay, perfect. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Thank if, you. If, if it were good. the other way around, then totally something would you describe. Thank you. Happen. Understood. Okay, okay. very good. Thank you. Sarah, can you go back one slide? Sure. So, so, so this is in terms of, uh, of T, so, so uh, am I, am I just being really slow here? Because I, I, I understand this, that, that, you know, if your if your credibility is moving in one direction, also your your belief is moving as these um, these right. happening. So, so you're you're saying that this this can never happen at a balancing rate, because if I'm if I'm sort of becoming more 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 convinced that I'm I'm going to be making an an error, it's just it, it isn't enough just to say say something on the credibility, right? It's it's credibility yeah. in comparison to my my posterior belief of uh, of, of of getting the the red sign things. Yes. Um, so I I don't know if this is going to address your question, but um, what's happening here is so you need to have this indifference between faking immediately and faking within faking after like some small period in time. Now, if yes. you wait. Um, What's going to happen is that your belief is going to drift down. So Correct. if you take at a later date, the expected penalty of error is higher. But yes. also what's true is that somewhere in between those two times, it's possible that you will receive a valid report. Sorry, you will receive a signal. And so that um, you will report and not make an error. And yes. because of the martingale property of the belief, your expected penalty of error from the two different strategies equalizes so that's why it, it doesn't matter yeah thank you I, I i thought it needed a little bit more than just just, yeah, no, just the sort it, of up or down yeah no it's uh, thank you for clarifying because yeah yeah i probably should mention that but thank you um okay so uh, just very briefly regarding the motive that a monopolist has for committing errors um so we documented and i, I talked a lot about the fact that even a monopolist will potentially commit errors, even though they have no preemptive motive. And the reason for this 
um, is the lack of commitment um, by firms. And let me justify what I mean by this. Um, in equilibrium, we have that with a monopolist, whenever beta is less than K, the firm is going to earn a payoff of beta if the story is true, because they will report, um, they'll get uh, whatever market share they get, which is going to be beta in this case, incur no penalty. And if the story happens to be false, they're just going to earn zero because either they report and their uh, market share exactly offsets the penalty of error, or they just never report. So that's what happens in equilibrium. But now let's ask what would happen if the firm could commit to never faking? So this is a situation where the firm commits to being completely truthful. In that case, its credibility is going to be perfect, meaning that the market share it earns when theta equals one is K. And if theta equals zero, if the story is false, the firm just never reports and earns zero. Because in this case, K is less than beta, sorry, K is greater than beta, this is better for the firm, that if they could commit, they would prefer um, being truthful to what they're doing in equilibrium. And in fact, what I can show is that being truthful is the unique commitment solution under a monopoly. Uh, so this illustrates that the lack of commitment is really what's driving the monopolist errors, but also that faking is bad for a monopolist, that this temptation to fake, to capitalize on its credibility is actually causing a deterioration in its payoffs. Um, so that's what I have to say about uh, monopolist errors and commitment. So moving on to the full model characterization, I'm going to start by asking under what conditions when we have competition, is the firm going to be truthful? Um, and what I find is that to support truth telling under competition, two things need to hold. First is the same condition we saw under the monopoly case, that the penalty of error needs to be sufficiently high compared to um, the maximal market share that the firm can get. But I also find the second condition has to hold, that the belief of the firm needs to be sufficiently low. Now, what this proposition tells us is first, that truth telling is going to be harder to sustain under competition because we have the second condition that we never needed under a monopoly. And the reason for this is that under competition, truth telling is costlier for the firm um, because of this preemptive motive they may have. Um, now, if, you look more, if we look more closely at this second condition, um, it tells us that the firm is only willing to be truthful if it is sufficiently pessimistic about the story. Uh, now, the reason for this is that if you have a firm that is really optimistic and you're in the presence of competition, um, that firm is going to think errors are going to be unlikely. And at the same time, the probability that I get preempted is going to be pretty high because there's a high probability that the other firm is going to learn the story, going to enjoy the market share, and I'm going to have lost my opportunity. So because of these two factors, this is why you can only have truth telling if P is sufficiently low. Now, I just told you when uh, the conditions under which, under which truth telling is possible in equilibrium. Now, let's ask what is going to happen on the region where truth telling doesn't occur. And what I show is that on that region, credibility is going to be uh, characterized by an ODE. Now, without spending time looking at this OD, I'll tell you where it comes from. It comes from this firm's indifference condition. To illustrate this, um, recall that this indifference implies that the firm needs to be indifferent if it is faking between faking immediately and faking after some small wait, after some small increment of time. So its values from those two strategies needs to be equivalent. Now we can take a Taylor approximation of the right-hand side, the value of faking after waiting. And what this is going to be equal to is the value of faking immediately 
plus a residual term. And this is going to represent the change in uh, value that the firm incurs from having waited a small period of time. And by waiting, two things are going to change for the firm. First is that its credibility is potentially going to change. And that's captured by this first term. But also by waiting, the firm is going to risk being preempted. So with some probability, it's going to be preempted, in which case it's going to incur some regret from being preempted. And what this regret term captures is uh, the sort of uh, how much uh, the firm would have been better off if it had not uh, been preempted, knowing that it has. So to be more precise, this P tilde is the firm's belief in the immediate aftermath of being preempted. And so this tells us how much better off the firm would have been knowing that they had been preempted if they had chosen to report at that time and not um, be in that situation. So that's the sense in which I call it a regret. Um, and setting this red term equal to zero is exactly what yields this OD. Um, so with this OD, I'm able to establish that there is going to be a unique equilibrium here. And very briefly to tell you where this comes from, um, in addition to this ODE that I have, I'm able to show that credibility has to satisfy one of two limit conditions, uh, depending on um, what region of the parameters you're in. So if you're in the region of the parameters where beta is greater than Kn, um, then if the firm becomes sufficiently pessimistic, it's going to converge to truth telling and this alpha has to converge to that value of one as you approach that point. And on the region of the parameters where the firm is never going to be truthful, then um, you have that this uh, level of credibility has to actually converge to the monopoly value. So these are the two limit conditions. Now combining these with the ODE is going to define a recursive set of boundary value problems where it's recursive because we have a different set for every period in time and the ODE for a particular period is going to depend on the continuation value. And so with this system of uh, ODEs and boundary value, sorry, boundary conditions, um, we get existence and uniqueness via the Picard theorem. So just one thing, is it recursive because you're saying we have four firms left, three firms left? Is it exactly. the recursive? I didn't understand. Okay. It's perfect. okay exactly. Thank you. And thank you. for each, yeah. Thanks. Okay. So now, uh, in terms of qualitative features of the equilibrium, economically, what does this tell us? Um, the first thing that I'm going to discuss is the dynamics in alpha. And what I can show is that this credibility is going to be weakly increasing, and strictly so, if you're in a particular region of the parameters. So if this penalty of error is greater than the maximum market share for the last firm. Um, I won't be getting into why this condition is important uh, today in the interest of time, but the reason why the last firm matters is because we have this, uh, this recursive structure, um, that what, whether the last firm is going to be truthful is going to determine um, the dynamics for all previous uh, firms as well. So in this case, you have that credibility is strictly increasing, and otherwise, you have that credibility is completely flat. Um, so to see why credibility is going to be in strictly increasing under that region of the parameters, um, it can be helpful to refer back to this indifference condition that I just showed you. Um, in particular, what this told us is that uh, the increase or the change in credibility has to exactly offset whatever the expected regret that the firm has from being preempted is. And whenever this regret is strictly positive, then credibility has to be strictly increasing. The economic reason for this being that if you have a positive regret from being preempted, in order to, uh, sorry, if you have a positive regret from being preempted and if credibility did not strictly increase, if it were either flat or decreasing, 
then the firm would have an incentive to fake immediately because by doing so, it can avoid being preempted. But what's going to happen in equilibrium is that this credibility is going to increase just enough to off that, offset that expected regret of being preempted and thus restore equilibrium. Um, and so the reason why we have these two separate cases is that the regret of preemption is going to be strictly positive precisely in the case when beta is greater than Kn. Um, in the opposite case, we have that the regret of preemption is going to uh, be zero. And I'll get to it uh, in a couple of slides. But the reason for this is that in this other case of the parameters, while you have that the Ks are decreasing, the alphas are going to be increasing the later the firm reports in such a way that preemptive uh, concerns completely disappear from the model. So under certain parameters, we have that, that preemptive uh, motives disappear in equilibrium. You have uh, nine minutes. 10 minutes, thank you. So I want to take a moment to just uh, discuss here what the effect of competition is. And to do this, I'm going to look at what the equilibrium credibility and faking is in the market for the first firm to report, comparing the case with where we have a monopoly to the case where we have multiple firms. And in particular, I'm looking at the case here where Kn is um, less than beta. So this is the case where preemptive concerns do occur in equilibrium. Um, and we see that uh, the introduction of competition causes both a deterioration in credibility, but also introduces dynamics. That competition is causing this alpha to increase and converge to the monopoly value from below. Regarding faking, we see that faking is going to be strictly higher under competition than it is under a monopoly. So we see here the effects of competition, deteriorating credibility and causing an increase in faking. Now, the second case of the parameters that I discussed where preemptive motives endogenously disappear, we actually have that the uh, equilibrium under competition is going to be equivalent to that under um, a monopoly. That if we're fixing the market's total ability to learn, the level of credibility in equilibrium and the level of faking is going to be identical in these two cases. So in this case, competition has no effect. Uh, so the graphs I showed you were implicitly assuming that no firms were reporting. So I was looking at credibility and faking, assuming that um, no new reports are being made. But in reality, over the course of the game, Firms do report, and reports by other firms are going to cause discrete changes in credibility and faking for others. So looking at the case where Kn is less than uh, beta, this is the case where we have preemptive motives in equilibrium, we see uh, that credibility is going to be strictly increasing until a firm reports. And this is going to cause a discrete change in alpha. Here we see these discrete downwards jumps in alpha, but also potentially upwards jumps. And on the right-hand side, we have faking. Again, faking is going to decrease over time, but reports by rival firms are going to cause these discrete upwards jumps or potentially downwards jumps in faking. So what I'm particularly interested in understanding here is this copycat effect I referred to, where a report by one firm is causing this instantaneous increase in B, in faking, which is consistent with hurting on the timing of reports. Now, briefly, I'm going to also show you the case where Kn is less than beta, sorry, Kn is greater than beta. And this is the case where I told you uh, preemptive motives endogenously disappear. And it becomes clear when you look at this graph that I've shown you here. Um, we have here the credibility, and we see that after a firm reports, credibility goes up. It jumps up after every new report, and these jumps in credibility are endogenously completely um, 
counteracting the downwards jumps in K. Um, but we see even in this case, even though alpha is increasing and credibility is increasing uh, for later firms, even in this case, we see that um, faking exhibits these upwards jumps. In other words, in other words, we see the copycat effect potentially occurring even in this case of the parameters. Um, so I want to take a moment now to understand what is happening here, and in particular, what the effect of the rival reports is on the reporting behavior of others. Um, so I'll note that when one firm makes a report, two things are going to change for the other firms that are still in the market. The first is that their relative order has now changed. Rather than potentially being the first, now they can only be the second. The second thing that changes is that their belief jumps up because they've observed the report of their rival and they're going to become more optimistic that the story is true due to this observational learning. Um, this first effect, the change in relative order, in general is going to have an ambiguous effect on faking, depending on how these Ks change. But the effect of observational learning is always going to have an exacerbating effect on faking. The reason for this being that when the firm observes the report of its rival and becomes more optimistic, first, it's going to expect a lower probability of error because it's more sure that the story is true. But at the same time, it's going to have a higher probability of being preempted because now they think it's possible that the story is true, in which case the other firms will receive arrivals of their own that the story is true and thus um, preempt me. So you have both of these factors pushing in favor of um, faking as far as observational learning goes. And the second factor tells us that the effect of observational learning on increasing faking is going to be especially strong when it's combined with a preemptive motive. When you're in that first case of the parameters I talked about where the preemptive motive does exist. Um, now, uh, very sort of the last thing I want to talk about before I move on to the conclusion is that um, we have that, I just discussed that observational learning is um, always going to cause an increase of faking in the aftermath of a firm report. Um, but this relative order, the effect of the relative order is ambiguous. So the net effect is in general also going to be ambiguous, which is why on those graphs I showed that sometimes faking goes up, sometimes it goes down. Um, but what I can show is that when the belief is low, when the P is sufficiently low, observational learning is always going to dominate. And we're going to have that the copycat effect will always occur in that case. I formalize this as corollary two, that if you're in the region of the parameters where um, the next firm to report is also going to fake, then there exists some threshold belief such that if you're below that threshold, you know for sure that the copycat effect occurs that after a report is made, the other firms will increase the rate at which they fake. Um, to give you a very brief intuition for this, the reason is that reports that are made when the P is low is going, are going to be highly credible because the firms um, who might report at such a time when the P is low are going to have a low, uh, or sorry, are going to be very pessimistic about the state. So they have a potentially very high penalty of error. So the firms that observe this report are going to um, take it into consideration a lot. It's going to have a big effect on their belief uh, because they know that those reports are credible. And because of that, observational learning is going to be particularly strong, so much so that you know that the copycat effect has to occur. Um, so I'm going to move straight to the conclusion. My objective with this paper was to understand both why and when firms are making errors. Um, regarding the motives for errors, I found that first, you have this inability of firms to commit to truth telling. And this is going to cause errors to occur, potentially even in the absence of competition, so even under monopoly. 
Um, but I found that competition is going to exacerbate errors through two separate motives. The first being the preemptive motive that firms face, but the second being this observational learning, which is going to cause existing errors to propagate through the market. Regarding the dynamics of reporting, I found that firms are going to be dynamically more credible over time, conditional and own reporting if they have a preemptive motive, but that you also have these discrete changes in reporting behavior that are triggered by a rival report. Um, and I documented what I call this copycat effect where one report causes a surge in faking by others, which I said was consistent with uh, clusters of errors and also clusters of valid reports, of correct reports. Um, and just as a final note, I think if there is one broad uh, message of this paper, it's uh, to provide some insight into how uh, preemptive concerns can have an effect on the quality of information that is provided. Um, I believe I am out of time. Thank you, Sarah. Um, you are just precise on time. Um, I would like to open the discussion now to our panelists. Um, should we do it in alphabetical order? Chiara? Um, okay, I'll go ready? first. <laughs> okay. Um, so yeah, I have, um, okay, so I'll start with a small question. Well, I'll start with the more interesting question. I'll ask as much. So the more interesting question I think I have is the following. Um, so what is the, so this is a natural com comparison to me, natural comparative statics result that I don't think you can be done uh, analytically, but at least numerically, maybe you could do. Um, I would, I'm wondering how, uh, what is the effect of the number of firms on the um, on the credibility, I'm thinking the distribution of the credibility at the end of the game. I'm thinking at the you know after everybody reports, for example, conditional indeed on theta equals zero, so they shouldn't have reported. At the end of the day, they report. I'm comparing two games, a game in which I have three firms and the game of or maybe ten firms. So you know, I'm thinking is. And going back indeed to your final thoughts, is indeed a lot, a big like a lot of competition is going to deteriorate. You could say uh, the uh, the quality of uh, of uh, of the news. So, you know, of course, this is a random object, so you could have you would have to do uh, uh, simulation. So, oh, you have it actually. Okay, yeah, I, I, was, I, I was going, to, I was going okay. to show you this. Uh, yeah, okay. What I'm showing you here is a simulation, but I also have the the formal result. So. Um, What's the effect of adding a firm is it's going to have a bit of a um, nuanced effect because on one hand, if you add a firm to the market, um, you're increasing potentially the preemptive motive of the other firms because now there's one more competitor that increases the probability. Okay. So which... let me just stop you there. So can you just tell me what you're plotting though? Of course. So this is the credibility. Um, where you have, uh, say, N firms in the market. Now I'm going to add an additional firm. But so this is the credibility when the fifth firm discloses or what? Sorry, I, I should be clear about that. This is the credibility of the first report. Right, but so because what I'm interested, you understand that there are too many random objects here. Like when you increase the number of firm, then the time at which the fifth or the sixth discloses changes. And okay. then you see what I mean. So, but still, I'll, I'll let you take and explain it. But so no, no, yeah. I, I understand. What you mean. And so. the answer there is that there's not going to be, I can't say that by, I mean, I should be careful about what I say here, but adding that additional firm, um, it, it's going to have a subtle effect because. If you have, for example, that credibility is going to deteriorate in the short term for the first reporter, um, this is actually going to have a good effect on uh, credibility for the next one. Because a report that is made um, in the aftermath of a low credibility report is one where there's going to be very low observational learning. So the other person is not going to have as much of that observational learning. So you have this sort of... Um, you can say that if for the first firm, sure, 
the credibility might be lower, but this is going to sort of mitigate or have this opposite effect for later reporters. So it's it's going to be, uh, yeah, there's a lot going on there, but. Yeah, because the related question was uh, uh, like, you know, in these papers, one wonders what's the effect indeed when you increase the number of players on uh, uh, waves of action and like, you know, what the, the most of the time in here is going to be spent on what just one after the other they are going to report and then nothing's going to happen, like, you know, typical exercise you could do here. And so that's going a little bit towards that direction anyway. I see. Uh, um, but uh, another uh, uh, small question I have is, uh, is this, so uh, in your model, when uh, it seems that the assumptions that your piece of news is conclusive that the state is one. Uh, so the important thing is that it makes you sufficiently optimistic that the state is one. So then you will be willing to indeed play, play that strategy of immediately revealing. But it doesn't really need to bring your belief exactly to one. It just needs to make you willing to play that strategy. Am I, so because that's going towards of you know, what if is inconclusive? Well, you cannot handle too many types out there. So you just want to have two types. And so I'm just saying, well, okay, so easy way to go towards inconclusive is just making the type that has a belief of one and just say, well, yeah, this is the piece of news that brings me always to the same belief that is likely less than one, but still. Is that correct? Or well, anyway, do you know anything else about relaxing the conclusive news assumption? That is an obvious question. Yeah, so for sure you, you can relax this uh, conclusive news assumption. And I think what you referred to, oh, sorry, what I think you referred to um, is uh, exactly right. That if you have that, you have this plus on learning where your belief comes really close to one when you learn, it's going to be uh, essentially equivalent. Um, where um, I'm saying that very loosely right now, but uh, yeah, it should be. But even if you have that the belief is jumping to something that's not quite one, um, you can have some qualitative similarities in equilibrium. Um, the difference being, of course, that um, depending on, uh, it's for sure going to change the equilibrium, but depending on how low that belief that you jump to is, you can potentially have situations where even somebody who learns that the story is true might not want to report. Um, so yeah, I, I'd say in general, if you have that belief jump close enough, then the, the results should go through qualitatively, but otherwise you're gonna have some weird stuff happening. I'll let, I'll let you also take the <laughs> question. Good. So, so let me. So, I have some questions uh, for, first about your model, and then about journalism. So, let's start with with the model, so so that we can we have time for them for sure. So, so I I think this goes in the same direction as Margaret as Kiara's question on um, on the um, sort of what what do we mean by by <clears throat> the amount of information that gets revealed in the game altogether. So, so one thing I think you could do is is ask what is the condi what what is the um, probability that an outsider would have on the state of the world at uh, at the point when the game ends conditional on the state being uh, the the, the uh, state being um theta equals zero right? right do we do we so so if we have if we have n firms they could all be faking at that point when the last one has has, has sent the fake report there's nothing more to learn and uh, the the belief ends there so, so you you could ask like uh, do do simulations and see what the um what what the probability distribution over over those end beliefs might be. And that that sort of the 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 one thing I I kept on thinking all, all the way through is is about this this sort of issue of credibility in determining the um uh the payoff when you make the the statement. You calculate the the credibility if I understood that correctly uh, instantaneously at the moment of the uh, of, of the uh, announcement. Now, uh, if people think backwards when they see further announcements, they're going to update their beliefs about about your your statement. So 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 in that sense, in that sense, you're you're giving a lot of um, 
importance to, to the in instantaneous um, payoff that, that follows immediately after it. And not, not sort of like when people have had the time to think about, well, wow, what was that statement now we've give, given all the, all the evidence? Right. Uh, so if I can just give, um, that's completely right. That here, you know, you're com you're ruling out the uh, possibility that these uh, consumers are readjusting based on later information, um, this credibility that they have for the firm. But the reason why, uh, or one of the reasons why I take this sort of stance um, is that if we're thinking about news media, and especially something like breaking news, what the firm really cares about is what are their clicks on the story as far as market share goes. And the sort of um, window for the, these sorts of clicks, if it's something like a breaking news event, I imagine to be pretty small. So um, the willingness of other uh, consumers to consume this um, story that was reported like five hours ago might be relatively low if at that time it comes out that the story is false, that what the firm really cares about is who's watching this show now, who's clicking on my um, my yeah, my yeah uh, article at this moment. But yeah, the, the point is well taken, <laughs> that it's a simplifying assumption. So, so, so let's let's go a little bit in the direction of journalism. So, so what we have here is everybody agrees what the story is, and then 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 we start getting things relating to exactly that. So, I I don't know exactly what it is you're you're thinking about when you're talking about the the, the Boston terrorist thing. So, but but if you take for example a, a report that says these, these were people from from uh, Azerbaijan, the next one could be these were people from Armenia. These were people from from uh, from Georgia. These were people from from Finland. So so you know so so, so there is a, there, there there are separate aspects to 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 the story which which are sort of somehow refuting one another and and th this is sort of like what 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 I try to to get in my head is is there and so so one thing I I was also having in my mind which is this uh, this thing where when news media in order to be able to sort of get things quickly to their readers they say here's the here's the story as reported by and then they they're referring to another uh to, to another source so so that i would take as as just just not not being really anything that that's just what gives the uh order kn right so so whoever is first then the the story so so, so i'm i'm conceding that to them but 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 there, there seems to be something that that relates to credibility in particular when you have so, so I don't know if this happens in other countries. Probably it does. In Finland, we have our equivalent of Guardian is owning our equivalent of of the Sun, and and whenever they want to re, uh, report something that might be hurtful for their for their, their their reputation in the Guardian verse, and they are saying, well, we are just doing journalism on the Sun of our own company, and that's kind of like. You you could see that that also playing out in these that that when you have breaking news of which you're not completely certain, you say here's here's the real news story, and then that then you're sort of like the the journalistic part you're you're putting on someone else. So any any thoughts on those kinds of tactics? Yeah, I mean, uh, to be honest, I yeah, this is uh, this is not a small detail. Uh, this is actually a, a big thing that does happen with breaking news is you cite the other firm. Yeah. Um, and I, I don't have that at all here. And, um, you know, th this is something that I, I have thought about quite a bit, how you might be able to model such a situation where um, you're sort of citing the other person. And what I referred to earlier about this, uh, this beta, where I said, okay, I treat these beta as being the same for all the reporters, regardless of how many people are reported. Um, but I said, also, you can think of a situation where if there's 10 firms that reported, my penalty is lower than if there were only five. Um, I'm thinking maybe you could think of a situation where you have a beta for the first firm, and then you have a beta for the second one, which is lower. I think maybe that could capture something like this, because yes, it looks bad if it turns out to be false, but I also cited... Um, this other firm, so the blame's partially on them. 
Um, yeah, I, I think actually this might be within the scope of this model, this could be a way of addressing this. Um, but yeah, it, it is a huge thing, so. Good, thanks. That's all I, I had. Thanks. Very interesting. Thank you. Okay, uh, we're exactly at 15 minutes past five, so uh, we're going to stop recording.